well over 90% of scholars acknowledge that the apostles had this experience. But presenting the minimal facts approach is by no means an acknowledgement that the gospels are unreliable. Not at all. Look, if you want to posit hallucinations or that the apostles were that delusional, I mean, a lot of people, again, won't even go there because it, it, they feel embarrassed just saying it out of their mouth. You hearing a contradiction, an alleged contradiction in the gospels should not hinder your ability to present the case for the resurrection. Hey everyone, this is Witcher Pastor and tell you today I'm on with Blake Genta. We're going to be talking about the minimal facts argument as well as just witnessing uh, what is good evidence for Christianity. Uh, Blake, how are you doing today? And can you give us just a little bit about your background and topic and life and job and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, first, thanks for, uh, you know, talking with me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my main thing is I, I run a website called beliefmap.org, but I, I'm an apologist, so I'm interested in helping uh, people come to see the truth of, of Christianity. I don't have a lot of formal background. Uh, I did go to Moody Bible Institute, but that's like, you know, like 1% of what I've done. I've been doing apologetics with a heavy emphasis on philosophy and New Testament studies um, and some of the sciencey stuff for over a decade. Um, so that means a, a lot of time spent building out belief map, which is supposed to be this tool for apologists to help them quickly see the debate unfold sort of before their eyes. So it's like a choose your own path debate. Um, and navigating it feels like having a conversation with an expert or watching like a live debate between experts. So it's like set up as green versus red. And that's made me have to dive into a lot of really deep stuff. And so that's pretty much what I do um, in terms of my apologetics work is I spend all day researching and putting that information together for people to explore those debates like does God exist and did Jesus rise from the dead? I've been invited to do a couple, um, you know, apologetics debates and some radio things on the side as well, but that's not, you know, my big focus as much. Yeah, you've kind of been out of it recently, but I mean, you had you had debates with Dil, Dil, Dil Hunty multiple times, Matt Dil, Dil Hunty, um, back when it was cool to do that. You had <laughs> uh, you had talks with Professor Dave, like before he went big. Um, so I've been following your work for a long time, so it's cool to do this. Uh, yeah. So um, obviously, this is not like the typical topic on this channel, but today I wanted to give uh, my listeners just good reasons to believe in Christianity. Um, you know, it kind of doesn't make much sense to spend all your time studying other parts of the Bible if you don't, you know, if you don't even believe in Christianity to begin with. Um, so, Blake, so obviously you're a Christian. Um, we're talking about the mental facts today, but you, um, I mean, I would assume that you don't just like, when you find some random person off the street, that you don't just like go straight, like, these are the minimal facts, like evidence, evidence, evidence. Um, can you talk about just your general approach in witnessing? Yeah. And are you, it's, it sounds like most of your audience, they're, they're people who are already Christians. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then like, and then do they have uh, like a, a good introduction to apologetics or? Um, um, well, most of my stuff is Old Testament. So oh, okay. um, basic is probably better. <laughs> okay. okay, cool. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, uh, for, for evangelism, yeah, I mean, the first thing, and you, you know, I used to work in sales as well, and there's a lot of similarity. You really got to understand the person first. That's where it all begins. Um, and you, you, of course, want to have a, you want to have a, a nice environment where both of you are intellectually curious and respectful. And um, basically, everybody loves to talk about what they believe if you ask them. Uh, and so I just spend a lot of time asking up front where, what they believe my game plan is usually to try to move them to at least acknowledging that theism is plausible. They don't have to believe it, but at least that it's plausible and that it's plausible that, um, that uh, God would, or excuse me, it's plausible that Jesus is a real historical figure. That's usually pretty easy to do. And then that it's plausible that God might actually choose to raise Jesus from the dead. You know, that there's something unique about him that makes him uniquely resurrectable. Um, and then with that stuff in place, as long as none of that stuff is particularly crazy for them, then I've got the main objections out of the way and they're ready to hear the case for the resurrection. Uh, and so from there, I um, present, yeah, a, a, what sometimes gets called a minimal facts approach. Uh, I just try to use some information that is pretty universally acknowledged by people who share their worldview, skeptics, 
And I use that fodder to make a, a pretty compelling case, I think, for the resurrection. It may not always convince them, but it should definitely shift them closer. And if I've got more time, then I'll just keep on keeping on more and more facts to be more and more persuasive. But usually that's my first big punch is that minimal facts sort of approach uh, to the resurrection. And I can explain right. what that is. But Yeah, yeah, go for it. Well, it, it's just the, in fact, there's a quote, I should probably have pulled it up already, but I, basically I read the same exact quote to people every time. So I'm actually just going to, going to go to belief. Here's how other people can get the quote too. I'm going to beliefmap.org. Then there's a menu on the left and I'm just going to click on God did raise Jesus from death. And the green evidence I'm going to click on is that people in groups were insisting that Jesus visited us. And then in response to that, Red says, so they lied in saying that he appeared to me. So I'm going to click on that now. And here's the response that I have on belief map to that. It's a bunch of stuff. But here's the quote. <clears throat> um, this is from Gary Habermas. He's a, a professor at Liberty University. Studying this stuff is, is like, that's what he does. That's his main, his main work is cataloging what scholars are saying, reading through it and and getting it all marked up. He says, quote, on the state of resurrection studies today, I recently completed an overview of more than 1,400 sources on the resurrection of Jesus published since 1975. I studied and cataloged about 650 of these texts in English, German, and French. Some of the results of this study are certainly intriguing. For example, Perhaps no fact is more widely recognized than that early Christian believers had real experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. A critic may claim that what they saw were hallucinations or visions, but he does not deny that they actually saw something. Um, and if I've got some additional time, I've got there's a lot of quotes that say this exact same thing from like the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels and from various historians. Um, and I like uh, how, oh, do I have the quote from Paula Fredrickson? Yeah, this is like a good way to summarize what scholars will say. She uh, She's a Jewish professor and a historian of early Christianity and Hellenistic Judaism. And she says, I know in their own terms, what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attests to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know as an historian that they must have seen something. And of course, she means something that convinced them that Jesus appeared to them and that he was now alive from the dead. So that's a really interesting starting ground because it means you you kind of knock off the lie hypothesis. Like, you know, the apostles were, you know, historians will agree, were proclaiming that Jesus appeared to them. And we know that they weren't lying and that really backs the you know the skeptic up in a corner because then it's like what what do you think they saw what happened what explains that experience of theirs and for a skeptic encountering that for the first time you've just cut off his main ways of escape um now he's got to say something like i don't know maybe they did hallucinate and even that feels really awful a lot of them aren't even willing to do that um uh, so it puts a lot of pressure very quickly and efficiently. And that's what I like to do, because when you put this epistemic pressure on someone, um, they want to find relief. And the, the way to find relief, um, if they're open to miracles and those other objections aren't in the way, the way to find relief is accepting that Jesus actually did rise from the dead and appear to the apostles. That Then problem solved. So that's a really quick way to do it. Um, sometimes if they want to hear the evidence against the hallucination theory or you know, an illusion theory, sometimes they'll say, you know, there's also the swoon theory out there that Jesus, um, you know, didn't really die on the cross. He sort of fainted and then he was, you know, put in the tomb and then he woke up in the tomb and then came back and presented himself as alive. Um, but a lot of times they don't even need to hear that. Um, it's, it's enough of a punch that, you know, it leaves them with something to chew on very, very quickly. So I like that approach. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, it definitely fits with like what we know about psychology and like how people come to beliefs and, you know, very rarely do when someone, you know, hears something like so like vital to like how you live life and all that, that you're just going to just rent, just all of a sudden change, change your view on something as soon as you hear, you know, evidence for it. Um, so 
Uh, obviously, you came on here willing to defend the minimal facts like argument, but at the same time, I would assume you think the Gospels give some evidence for the resurrection. So, why are you such a fan of the minimal facts, and like, why not just pre present all evidence just right out for God and Christianity and both? Yeah, the emphasis on the word right out, um, because obviously I do present all the evidence on belief map I go through, you know, and it's continuing to grow. Um, but yeah, when it comes to what I present right out, uh, you know, whenever you have a, it depends on who I'm chatting with, but most of the time, if I'm speaking with someone, I like to, you know, in sales, it's called the path of least resistance. I want to get them as far along to the conclusion as I can. Sometimes it's enough and it's an, it, it ends up being a great starting place. So I use the minimal facts approach like I just described it because when you use premises that the person already accepts, you've, you've saved yourself a lot of time and you get to jump straight to the best explanation of the facts of those premises. Um, so it's just a matter of efficiency, really. Um, if, if that case isn't enough to really push them over the edge, then I'll continue, like I said, introducing more facts and I'll just make them more and more uncomfortable until they're ready to move. And, you know, maybe that'll never happen, but that's my goal as an apologist. That's what being persuasive is, introducing more and more of those facts and helping establish more and more premises that make the conclusion more and more firm. Very interesting. Okay. So, um, you know, the way I look at any topic of a field, whether it be science, Bible, psychology, whatever, you know, we as laymen don't have all the time in the world. Uh, and I'm asked to talk about just like, you know, other topics of the Bible. And a lot of times I'm like, I, I can't even like even ask you questions or interview on it because I just haven't studied it enough. So, um, so obviously it's going to happen a lot for everyone because we just don't have all the time to study it. So something the minimal facts does is, like, if you want to posit an, an explanation that goes against the minimal facts, you have to basically, um, well, you don't have to, but a lot of times you end up arguing the, against the consensus. Um, but, and of course, that's, that's awkward because, like, we're not scholars. We haven't spent all the time to study that. I mean, do you advise, like, going against that from, like, your experience, like, just consensus in general, or... I mean, is it for you? Is it all right? If that's the consensus, we're just going to believe it, or what is? What is? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, probably, probably predictably, I would say a consensus makes a good starting place. It's a good rational place to begin. Uh, and and you're exactly right about what you said um, in terms of of what a person is going to be comfortable believing and. and like a good example of this is that we've all encountered someone bringing to us some kind of conspiracy theory um, and us not being able to respond necessarily to the conspiracy theorist. Like I remember at Moody, there was a, a guy who made some, you know, case to me that, you know, there was some conspiracy behind 9-11 and he talked all about like the, you know, how it couldn't have been hot enough to like melt the beams or, and stuff. I don't even remember it all, but I didn't have a response to any of that. But nevertheless, um, I know that that wasn't like a very, you know, academically popular explanation of things. And that uh, it, for me, was a good reason to be skeptical, even though I didn't have a response at the time. Um, I've also found out, you know, as an apologist doing apologetics for a long time that you know, if you have enough time with someone, it's great to talk about, for instance, the, the, the case for like intelligent design. But um, usually it's going to be more of a hindrance in your conversation because there's such a strong academic consensus in favor of Darwinian evolution that the person, even if you stump them, it's not going to even move them a little bit uh, because they're just so confident that other people have an answer. And so um, in, in that regard, it's... Uh, it's, I would say that's why it's important to try to work with the premises that they accept. You, you need to, you need to try to be on some firm ground with them that, that that's not asking too much of them at once. And I think that that, that the minimal facts approach is able to accomplish that for them really well. Cause again, they, they can, we can all sort of have as a good starting place that, that, you know, the, that the apostles genuinely believe that Jesus appeared to them because it's unanimously accepted. Even by scholars who don't want to admit it, there they are admitting it. And, you know, the idea behind it is that the skeptic is going to say, okay, 
if basically everyone with my worldview who goes into this field uh, and spends time actually learning it, if they all come out agreeing on the same thing, then there's probably really good evidence there that would convince me too if I spent the time to get my doctorate and whatnot. And that's enough for them to say, okay, I'll go ahead and, and accept those premises because it's unanimously accepted. And, that, and you're off to the races. Well said. Uh, so I don't think we actually mentioned it. Um, could you just list the minimal facts? Like, what are these scholars? Uh, what are they? You know, what, what? I guess what are the percentages of like how many? Obviously, all these scholars don't believe in every single minimal fact. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, I know Gary and, and Mike will get into you know different versions, and they might include different facts based on different criteria. For me, I just jump in with the fact that I gave you, that the apostles genuinely believe that Jesus appeared to them. If they um, try to, for instance, talk about um, the hallucination theory as an explanation of what the apostles experienced, then um, I, would, I might talk about like the empty tomb. And, even, and for that, it's like 75% of scholars, um, according to Gary, uh, except that the tomb was empty. Um, and, you know, that can be like a, a starting place. That's not a minimal fact, by the way. Um, but I can talk about some scholarship there to help people get some quick bearings and then to start to look at the evidence themselves. But as far as ju like just I, I stick with basically one minimal fact to make my to make the strongest part of the case. So. Very interesting. I, I didn't realize that about you. That's very cool. Yeah, uh, I don't you know what sometimes what Gary will do or Mike will do is they'll put some of the those facts up front. And in me, I only introduce them when they're necessary. So that would be a, I guess, a minor difference between how we approach it. Yeah, I can definitely, definitely see the positive in that as from like a psychological perspective, it's like you don't want to overwhelm them with just all these random facts before they can even like understand what's going on. So that's, that's very mm -hmm. cool. I like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, so there's a lot of Christians that they, they take the approach that we should just, you know, give all of the evidence for Jesus's resurrection, not only the mental facts. So you got First uh, Corinthians fifteen. You have uh, the the Gospels. Obviously, I mean, you, they think the Gospels would be a really good source of evidence for a lot of people. Um, but that's obviously that's not what the mental facts does. So uh, why wouldn't we just go right out and you know give all of the evidence for it if if like. I mean, I, I think you would say that we do that anyway. You eventually do that anyways, right? Um, not necessarily. It's going to depend on, on the person, really. Um, for most people, if they're skeptics, uh, I don't need to go into that sort of detail in order to get my main premise, uh, in order to like push them. I can put pressure on them quickly by just getting them to agree that the apostles genuinely believed, not simply that Jesus rose from the dead. That's completely different but believe that Jesus appeared to them, believe that they actually experienced Jesus appearing to them. That's different than just believing he rose. Uh, sometimes people like try to compare the, try to compare the argument to like, Oh, well, look, Muslims really, really believe, look, they, they crashed into the towers. They really believe it. Yeah. But they weren't in a position to actually know. I'm pretty sure the apostles knew whether they had this experience or not. They were the experts on whether they had this experience. Um, so that's an important difference. Uh, and yeah, once that, once that groundwork is laid, they accept it quickly because they don't want to, you know, disagree with like this huge consensus. And for the apostles, and for, you asked about numbers before, I want to say it was, it's well over 90% of scholars acknowledge that the apostles had this experience. Um, we don't have, you know, precise statistics on what exactly they think they saw, um, but you know, we don't have to, the, you know, any, any hallucination hypothesis is going to be in big trouble. And the less convincing you make the hallucination hypothesis, the harder time you're going to have to explain why the apostles believed that Jesus rose from the dead because an unconvincing hallucination isn't going to convince anybody. Um, but maybe we'll cover that a little, a little bit more later. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned the numbers, uh, how, I mean, how do you know that the majority of scholars believe that, you know, they hope that they they believe that the disciples believed that um, they actually had an experience. Or... I, I take uh, Gary's testimony on that one. Um, he's he's a pretty well recognized scholar. And, um, you know, you, you, if you read his books, you know, he's no slouch in terms of 
in terms of his work. So that's not the kind of thing you lie about. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, so there wasn't a study done, right? Do what? Was there like a study done? Like, I mean, we don't have obviously like a peer review paper or whatever. Yeah, I mean, well, but, yeah, it's not like he's like published his results. But if you read many peer reviewed papers, you'll find that a lot of times they don't actually publish all their results. They, you know, like the, the actual data sets. Sometimes there's not like a clean way to do that. But nevertheless, they can report on what those results were, depending on how deep the study is. Gary hasn't like sat down and, and laid out all that data. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's not lying. <laughs> so, so what he has published is sufficient, I think, for the rational person. And I don't yes. see scholars doubting it either personally. So, yeah. Is it, you and, mentioned and, that. And, and the thing, in addition to his formal stuff, you have all this testimony from scholars on the side, basically saying this is what our field believes. Um, so, you put all that together, I, it's, yeah. I have no reason to doubt him in that regard. Yeah. So why not just you know obviously maybe maybe he's like you know a genuine person, but you know obviously you have like some scientists um, out there though they'll post or they'll like, you know, submit papers and peer review, but their, their standards of study and how they conduct experiments on that, maybe it's not like as good as it can be if you want to find truth. So in those regards, like, even if they're being honest, it, it doesn't think almost like there's like standards you follow to, to conduct studies. Like how, I mean, how do we know that Gary even did that? So I see kind of two questions there. There are, of course, like, you know, double blind sorts of tests and, and things that, that people do to avoid bias in, in certain kinds of tests um, or, or studies. I just don't I don't think that really applies here. Um, this is this isn't, you know, that complex. It's not like th there's not much room for the interpretation of data. Um, you know, people are going to give this or that explanation in the text. And as long as they're speaking English, you know, Gary gets to put a check where, where it belongs. Um, and yeah, I, I, again, the, if it were highly implausible that what Gary was saying, if it were highly implausible that it were, tr that it was going to be true, then maybe that's, you know, maybe I'd start to say, okay, Gary, let's start, to, let's sort of see the exact statistics here, but there's just really no, no need for that um, in my mind. Uh, again, we have a surplus. I can you can go on belief map and you can see all these different scholars saying that this is you know pretty par for the course in the field. Um, on the one hand, uh, so when Gary comes out and says, "Hey, I've actually done the the head counting here and I've got all this paperwork," and Mike Lacone has talked about, you know, it's it sounds like it's pretty disorganized. It's it's the kind of thing that would take a lot of work for him to actually uh, crystallize it into something publishable. Um, but nevertheless, it's there. So you got Mike's testimony, you got Gary's testimony, and you've got high plausibility. Um, you know, Gary's a respected scholar, put all that together, and there's just not really much. I, I'm just not worried about the accuracy. And I, and again, most people aren't that I've come across. Anybody that I sort of present that, just the, the that quote to, I've never heard anybody come back and really doubt uh, the accuracy of it. So for what it's worth, it's it's it has all the power and evangelism that you could ask for. Got to, yeah. Um, I mean, not to, like, you know, repeat the, 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 the point or anything, but, I mean, aren't most scholars Christians? Like, if you're going to do a poll, if all of them are Christians, like, wouldn't we expect them to believe that the disciples had an experience? Several points. One, it's not the case that almost all of them are Christians at all. In fact, we just heard that statistic a second ago that, only 75 percent accept the empty tomb and the empty tomb is like we got really good evidence for that there's lots of non-believers uh oh your video cut out am i am uh, i with you i'm still here i'm just okay. uh yeah okay cool you're just you're just like giving me some attention so yeah that's right some video love all right <laughs> um there uh, i was saying yeah so 75 percent of only 75 percent of scholars accept the empty tomb Many have pointed out that there's not one bit of evidence against the empty tomb, and there's an overwhelming amount of evidence for it. Um, and there's lots of non-believers who accept the empty tomb. So, I mean, you put all that together, I, I wouldn't be surprised if half or less than half were actually Christian. Now, you do have to know that a lot of scholars do claim to be Christian, but they're, 
they don't actually like believe in miracles. So there's like this weird phenomenon a lot uh, for a lot of these folk that's kind of like unique to to the field. Um, they're like religious in that sort of way. <clears throat> um, but you can even set all that aside. What's relevant is that in that quote I gave you, Gary says that even among critical scholars, this is fairly unanimously granted. So you don't even have to mention all that other stuff I just mentioned. You just read the quote um, and it, it's got you covered. Yeah. So uh, a big complaint of the mental effects argument is that we, I mean, we don't even know that like that it's even possible that God exists. And not only that, but God, supernatural, like if we don't even know supernatural things exist or occur, then like how can we even posit that Jesus rose from the dead? Don't we first need to show that it's possible before we can be making claims that Jesus rose from the dead? You technically don't, but I find it in practice, it's more, that's a more organized way to approach it. And so that's why I said at the beginning, usually I start by asking a person questions. Um, if they don't believe in God, then I like to spend some time there first and get them to agree that that theism is not crazy. So I've got, you know, various arguments that I'll give them there. You actually, I'll start off asking, do you have any reasons to think God doesn't exist? Um, and we'll, we'll go through that. And usually that, that I find, you know, you, there are some nice, simple and effective answers that will handle most anything you come across there. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they might want to hear a little bit of evidence for God. As long as they agree that the God hypothesis is not crazy, that's enough to move forward. Um, if the God hypothesis remains crazy for them, then, uh, yeah, the resurrection, which entails God's existence, is going to be too hard. Uh, or, or, you know, you're going to have to really give a lot of good evidence and, and really press the point before you convince them that God exists and Jesus rose if they don't already accept the plausibility of God. So as a matter of of habit and practice, I think it's smart to spend a little bit of time talking about theism and making sure that they agree that theism isn't crazy. There's at least like a 10% chance or 5% chance that theism is true. Even a 1% chance isn't that bad. Um, and then you want to make sure that there's a decent chance that Jesus is a real historical figure. Again, you can quickly pull up quotes for that. Um, it's unanimously granted at universities and whatnot. Um, everybody who looks into it comes to the, the virtually everyone comes to the same conclusion they're like i want to say that there are like five in any field you got your crazies but there are only like five named um people with their doctorate in a relevant field who doubt jesus existed and even they won't even say oh he didn't exist they'll say oh there's room for doubt and a lot of them are associated with like atheists so <laughs> like, like richard carrier and they you know that's sort of their crowd which is very telling that that even they won't flat out deny it usually um and then, yeah, you want to talk a little bit about whether it makes sense for God to raise Jesus from the dead. Um, because uh, look around. God doesn't seem to be in the habit of raising people from the dead. So if, if someone told you that your neighbor rose from the dead, you'd probably or that God raised your neighbor from the dead even more specifically, you, you know, you'd be quite understandably skeptical. And um, you better give a reason generally, unless you've got super duper good evidence, you better give a reason for why that's not. Uh, ridiculous. Like, what's unique about your neighbor? Why on earth would God do that kind of thing? You know, sometimes, you know, your socks go missing and people make fun of those God of the gaps types are type arguments. What makes it a God of the gaps argument is that it's ad hoc, right? It's just, it's just makes, it's not the kind of thing that God would plausibly do. That's why none of us appeal to God when our socks go missing or our car stops working. Right. But when it comes to like the beginning of the universe, well, that is the kind of thing that God would do, you know, or or the design of, of the human body or consciousness or, you know, the the fine tuning of the universe or the fine tuning of Earth. Those fit very well, given our understanding of God and all of his goodness and, and creation, his, his desire to create. Um, so that fits. It's a hand in glove sort of fit. And you should be able to tell a basic story about why raising Jesus uniquely fits with theism, I think. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so 
So someone that you know uses the minimal effects, uh, would you ever consider granting that the Gospels were embellishments, mythical, made up just for the sake of argument? And uh, I mean, isn't that what the minimal effects is doing if you're kind of essentially ignoring the Gospels? No, not at all. Not at all. You're just saying, look, I, you know, you can say, I think the Gospels are very reliable, but I know that you don't necessarily believe that. And me convincing you is going to be a lot like me convincing you that man didn't land on the moon. Even if I gave you these really good arguments and stumped you, it's not going to convince you that man didn't land on the moon. I acknowledge that. I'm going to work within those boundaries. I'm going to work with something that that you can believe really quickly um, and effectively be a premise that because on the grounds that you now know that all these scholars agree with it. Um, so that's so, uh, but I mean, I'm, I'm happy after I present the case for the resurrection that that minimal case, um, it, it's not uncommon to like turn to like step back and now try to solidify it and make them feel it more and more. And, and that it does make a lot of sense to spend time talking about the gospels. But presenting the minimal facts approach is by no means an acknowledgement that the Gospels are unreliable. Not at all. An issue with most historical cases is the biblical data saying that those who both believed the supernatural, witnessed miracles, and were familiar with the facts still did not believe. I mean, see Matthew 28, 17, Mark 16, 11 to 13, Luke 24 to 11, John 20, 25. Although we don't assume that the texts are reliable using the minimal facts, these examples are at least are a possible example of counter evidence for the claim that the disciples believed for bad reasons. Uh, I mean, if if the minimal facts doesn't get us to the idea that we know exactly why the disciples believed that Jesus rose from the dead, and then we have counter evidence for the claim that that they might have been believing for the wrong reasons, doesn't that kind of hurt our approach there? So there, there are a couple of these Christians. I find I find it very strange their approach. But what they will say is they'll say, "Well, we can't use a minimal facts approach because uh, the minimal facts approach can't show that the apostles weren't crazy, basically." And my response to that is, I, everybody brings background knowledge to the table, and it's enough for me to say to the non-believer. Look, if you want to posit hallucinations or that the apostles were that delusional, um, okay, let's talk about that. I mean, a lot of people, again, won't even go there because it, it, they feel embarrassed just saying it out of their mouth. But then you can go into some of the statistics about hallucinations and the probability that someone's going to be delusional about this sort of thing, much less a group of people about this sort of thing um, in these sorts of circumstances. Uh, and, you know, it just becomes very difficult to maintain. Um, now, that doesn't mean there's no reason to go on and, and introduce more data to try to show that they are, um, you know, not crazy. And that's probably exactly what I do. If someone really wanted to try to throw out the apostles are crazy, I would go to the Gospels. I'd say, look, um, here's a case for like at least maybe not the full blown inspiration or even full blown reliability of the Gospels, but we can get some rely, you know, here's some stuff that, that was embarrassing that was said. And, you know, that's a reason to think it's authentic. It's not the kind of thing Christians would invent. And look, based on this embarrassing thing, it seems like they're pretty, um, you know, pretty skeptical. Doesn't sound like they're crazy, does it? So I don't even defend the whole reliability of the gospels at that point, but I'll use some of these, some of these sorts of arguments to get t bits and pieces um, to make the case that the gospels, or excuse me, that the apostles weren't crazy, you know, as necessary. But um, usually people already feel a little, you know, pressure if they feel like they have to go to the point of saying that all these people were just like that delusional and that crazy that they would just believe something for no reason at all. Um, and I don't, again, I'm not talking about believing something like some religious claim. I'm talking about a belief that they saw Jesus appear to them alive from the dead to the point that it convinced them that he rose. Because, um, of course, people can believe crazy things if it's just like a religious belief that they hear. Lots of people are crazy and are, are irrational in that regard. But I don't find people very irrational in terms of recounting what they themselves have witnessed. So, hmm. so it, it's, I'm noticing that when you're, you're taking this minimal facts approach, it's not necessarily like this is how we find truth, but it's just, in your, in your eyes, it's a good approach to you know, talking to people and get, kind of getting on their level as far as, like, 
walking them through the evidence, essentially. Um, That's exactly right. It's an evangelism strategy. It's I mentioned before about sales, the path of least re resistance. I want to, you know, get people as close to the gospel and, and accepting Christ as Lord as I can as quickly and efficiently as I can. And, you know, as Gary Habermas and Mike Lacona point out in their original book in 2004, the whole point of their approach was to avoid these quote unquote rabbit trails, like someone raising a contradiction. You hearing a contradiction, an alleged contradiction in the gospel should not hinder your ability to present the case for the resurrection. You don't need to go down that. You need to say, okay, you know what? Fine. Let's, let's grant for now that the gospels have some contradictions. Here's some stuff that scholars grant anyways, despite acknowledging there are contradictions, because these are still historical works. Historians still have things that they believe that come out of them. Um, that's part of the course for um, historical studies. Uh, and again, based on what you already, based on the stuff that they all acknowledge and, and you consequently are willing to follow them in acknowledging, we can, here's our awesome, awesome argument. That's a, a nice, simple approach for me. Uh, there, I should say that Mike Lycona did publish a book in 2010 that he calls a new historiographical approach. Mike Lacona's new book, in my view, is not the same as what went on in their 2004 book. Their 2004 book was for evangelists. It was written for evangelists to do evangelism effectively and efficiently. And that's what I'm doing to this day. Um, Mike Lacona, though, uh, he, 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 we can, his, he calls the bedrock approach. His is more um, suspect, I would say, and it's more um, susceptible to some uh, epistemological uh, challenges that I think he might need to deal with, um, where he basically says, look, if you're a scholar, here's a good way to approach the data. Um, you know, partition off stuff that you're not sure about, um, you know, focus on things that are unanimously accepted and that have the relevant evidence. And then if you can basically get to a conclusion based on those, that bedrock, then you're warranted in believing it. I think there are Bayesian problems with, with his approach there. Um, but for now, all that's relevant to point out is it's not the same as the evangelism strategy. It's not a historiography, but the evangelism strategy in the original 2004 book that really Gary, Gary pioneered. Interesting. Very fascinating. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, yeah. so when we talk about the mineral facts, one of the facts is that Jesus, or one of the facts is that the disciples had experiences shortly after Jesus' death that convinced them that Jesus had risen. It mm -hmm. doesn't say anything about the specific experience included in the mineral facts. So, you know, this essentially a survey of opinions um, that the disciples had this experience. Um, you know, an atheist scholar like Gerd Luneman says, uh, the experience that the disciples had was a seeing in the spirit. So Bar Art, Bar Ehrman thinks that the most they possibly experienced was seeing Jesus in the sky from a distance, but he doesn't even believe that. If all we can grant is that the disciples had a religious experience that caused them to change their mind, that doesn't tell us anything about if they were actually justified in believing Jesus rose from the dead. So we, I mean, we all agree that people irrationally believe things. Wishful thing, cognitive dissonance is a real thing. Uh, I've heard that there are 11 million flat, earther, flat earthers in Brazil alone. They could have been hallucinating. Jesus' younger brother could have been playing a practical joke on the disciples. All they had to do was be a little dehydrated one day, hallucinate for just a little bit, and then they, you know, they really want to believe Jesus rose from the dead. So that, that's what they believe. So, like, does that not put any doubt in, like, how much evidence we can, like, how, much, how far the, the minimal facts approach gets us? I, I mean, obviously, the dehydration thing is not going to be too relevant. There does, if you have hallucinations, you do need to have a medical etiology for it. Um, and uh, there, there is no good proposed etiology for the apostles hallucinating. Um, the most popular one that some have tried to put forward is bereavement hallucinations. So when you have uh, particularly elderly people who have lost their spouse, it's not too uncommon for them to have some kind of experience. They are, they know it's a hallucination. None of them think that their spouse has risen from the dead, but they might see a, 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 an image of their spouse standing there or something um, for a limited period of time. So that's really the only 
type of hallucination I know that is, is being talked about. Um, Richard Carrier, again, he's kind of kooky, uh, many would say, but he's tried to suggest maybe the apostles were schizophrenic, or he likes to mitigate it a bit to try to help by calling them schizotypal, whatever, you know, I'm not even sure that's a real category, but, um, you know, schiz people who are schizophrenic are also, that's one of the unique etiologies, one of the rare etiologies that can result in hallucinations. But there's just tons of problems with Carrier's model um, that, you know, we don't really have time to get into. But that, but in, in my debate with Matt Delahunty, I list 10 of the problems. Um, and with respect to these bereavement hallucinations, uh, you know, the, the, none of the apostles were married to Jesus. None of them had that kind of deep relationship to Jesus. He wasn't family. He wasn't part of their life. They were with him for a couple of years and, you know, even he was detached from them quite, quite a bit of the time, just completely different. And the idea that all, that all of them or even a, a significant subset of them, even a few of them, honestly, even one of them would have a bereavement hallucination. I don't think that that fits, um, you know, the case books on bereavement hallucinations. Um, so, but I mean, here you've got to posit multiple people, um, seeing Jesus alive from the dead. And here's the other thing is that if you, you just see a quick image of the guy, as N.T. Wright points out, N.T. Wright is one of the greatest living New Testament scholars who specializes in that time around. People at that time already knew about hallucinations. They did believe in ghosts. A lot of them did believe in ghosts and spirits, um, in which the apostles could have chalked it up to that. Um, they didn't. Uh, something convinced them it wasn't. Um, they called it resurrection. Even in 1 Corinthians 15, it's called a resurrection. The resurrection is a physical thing. Uh, unanimously, again, that's unanimously granted nowadays. It was actually denied for a little bit. They, there was some room for debate. But nowadays, it's it, resurrection is physical, period, in Jewish thought. Um, uh, but, yeah, the, the hallucination hypothesis is just not going to fit with what the apostles were, were saying that they saw. Um, and yeah, bereavement hallucinations don't apply. So there's just no serious etiology that could explain, um, what they experienced. I would say if, if Gerd Ludemann, when he, I, I don't know what his verbiage means in the quote you read, but elsewhere, he said that they did visually see something in front of them. That was a hallucination. It wasn't just like seeing in the mind's eye, like I imagined this, uh, and, and I'm internally visualizing it. His model has been that they their mind projected the image as hallucinations always are. So regardless of that verbiage you read, he he isn't denying that they that they saw something in that regard. Um, Bart Ehrman, I don't know why on earth he would talk about they only saw Jesus in the sky. Um, maybe he's talking about the ascension or he's pulling. Stuff, but I mean that's really a really weak sort of thing um, that he's positing there. He's probably trying to connect it with an idea of a hallucination. Um, but there's just no grounds for it. He doesn't give an etiology. I th actually, he, he talks about bereavement hallucinations. That's his big go-to. But I don't know any bereavement hallucinations that are seen by multiple people, much less up in the sky. Like, that's not where the hallucinations appear, even in bereavement hallucinations, as far as I know. So uh, he's, he's really – he, bas Bart Ehrman is a, an adamant defender of anti-Christianity, okay? And so he's got a lot of pressure to try to – and he's had a lot of time to kind of go back and forth with like Mike and apologists. And that's what he does. He's an anti-apologist, anti-Christian. And he's just kind of backed himself into the corner, uh, the only corner he can. Uh, that, well, I'm going to say it's a hallucination too, but that it doesn't fit well with the data. Um, and yes, I'm, ha I'm more than happy to go into the additional details. If I run into a scholar or someone who's like proficient enough um, uh, to, and, and really wants to like, like go down that, that path, which again, most people don't, most people aren't going to take that too seriously. Um, unless they really are skeptical of God or really skeptical of miracles or really skeptical of this other stuff, in which case I would have addressed that earlier. But if someone happens to want to go down that path, then I'm happy to spend a few extra, uh, uh, some extra time to try to defend some relevant parts of the gospels to say, look, the empty tomb is a fact too. How, how does, how, how can you have an hallucination if you've got an empty tomb? What's going on there? Um, there's a lot of additional details that I can argue for along the way, but I don't need to. For most people, they just instantly recognize that appealing to nobody 
Nobody, I guarantee you go on the streets to people who are skeptical of Christianity and the resurrection. Nobody thinks they would ever have to resort to appealing to hallucination to make sense of the data. I mean, in their mind, realistically, as soon as it comes down to that, they know they've lost in, in that regard. And I don't want to treat it like, oh, it's a win-lose situation. But you know what I mean? Like they know that something's wrong, that they've got a problem if they have to resort to hallucination. And yeah, that's so, so it's yeah. effective. It's effective. It leaves them like they, they're going to chew on it for a long time and maybe even be convinced by it. Yeah, so it seems like even though some of these scholars that are, you know, obviously uh, agree with the rest of the scholarship that, you know, the, the disciples had this experience, even though that some of them, like, think the experience is, like, super weak and uh, doesn't give you much evidence for Christianity, you think that that's enough to make the argument that, hey, if you do have to go that far, you have to uh, plot, you know, posit some, like, pretty ludicrous stuff. Is that a good way to put it? What I would say is that all the evidence just points straight forward to Jesus appeared. The reason why a guy like Airman will go on to say, well, I think they saw something in the sky is not because there's any actual data that tells him that. He just knows that he doesn't want – he just knows that it's hard on his worldview to, to acknowledge that Jesus actually appeared in, in the normal way that appeared means. So as, as a function of his atheistic worldview – that he goes on to say, or anti-Christian worldview, he's trying to make the sense of the data as best he can with his background knowledge. And I, you know, I don't. If you have his background knowledge, then yeah, I, I would do the same thing. I'd try. I'd try to say, well, it's hallucination, and if it's a hallucination, it probably wasn't like Jesus appeared to them in like this robust physical form. Um, I'm going to try to make the most hallucinatory sort of appearance I can but that somehow is convincing and would convince all of them. And it's a, it's got a really hard line to walk, but I'd probably try to do something like Airman does, but I'd feel the tension. I know Airman feels the tension there. He's got to, um, but most people aren't going to be that, you know, that convinced that it couldn't be, you know, that that just couldn't be the case, at least, especially if you've covered some of that earlier ground I was talking to you about. And that's actually where I'd, I'd start with Airman as I would talk to him about the plausibility of God existing. Of the, and he believes in the res in Jesus's historicity. He's certain of it. Um, but then also the plausibility that God might raise Jesus from the dead. And I, and I think that if I can do that effectively, he, he wouldn't feel so pressured to try to re to try to, you know, make the data say something that it doesn't quite naturally say. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, you know, almost, it seems a bit odd. So, you know, most people, when you get into these discussions, it's like, all right, I'll give you my best evidence for something, and um, that's why you should believe in it. But technically, you're, you're taking a bit of a different approach where you're basically saying that, okay, so, you know, all the scholars, pretty much all the scholars believe that the disciples had a religious experience. Um, you know, the average person on the street... I don't even street, like calling it a religious experience. I don't, I don't know... If I mean, what's a religious experience? I don't know. It, what they say they saw is Jesus appearing to them alive from the dead. That's what they saw, they say. Okay. All right. That's a better way to put it. All right. So so all these scholars, they believe that uh, he, they had some type of experience about Jesus. And, Jesus appearing to them. Yeah. yeah. Jesus appearing to them. And it, it seems a little weird to, like, you know, give this... Um, give this argument but you know most people on the street they're not going to mention how or they're not even going to be like familiar enough enough with the subject to realize oh just because they had an experience it doesn't mean that it was you know enough to justify belief in christianity so it seems like for a lot of people like you're almost like not including counter evidence does that make sense um what do you, what do you mean it wasn't enough to justify belief in christianity Oh, like, um, you know, a bit, you know, if, if we're going to say, so like all of the scholars, you know, believe that there was some type of experience of Jesus um, being there, but, um, you know, that doesn't specifically mean that you, like the person you're talking to should believe in Christianity. Um, I mean, maybe you might make that argument, but that, that doesn't mean that all the scholars actually think that, you know, Jesus actually was there, like, 
that, that like most scholars, you know, the, some of these other scholars would think that there's other explanations. Yeah, um, or as but, Paula Fredrickson says, I don't yeah. know what they saw. I know right. they saw something, but I don't know what they saw. Yeah, and I would just say, well, look, you have to understand everybody comes to these questions with different background knowledge. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, if I sat down with those scholars, usually if they don't believe that it was a real appearance, like if they're not quite convinced of that, it's not because the evidence isn't there. It's because they've got some other stumbling blocks. They either are very skeptical of God's existence or they're very skeptical that God would raise Jesus from the dead. They don't think that's the kind of thing that God would do. Um, those are the reasons why those scholars have not accepted that Jesus actually appeared from the dead. It's not because the evidence isn't there. And if you yourself, my friend who I'm speaking with, Mr. Skeptic, don't share their skepticism about God and don't share their extreme skepticism about God's inclination to raise Jesus, you don't have to follow them in you know, like trying to come up with more extreme versions or interpretations of the data. You can just accept the natural interpretation, which is that Jesus actually appeared to them. I mean, that's that's what it that's what it says. That's what they believed. And if you're going to and and remember that. Someone like Bart Ehrman has to really struggle. He has to really walk a fine line that you don't have to. That fine line for him is like dealing with the data that straightforwardly suggests Jesus just appeared to them in, in, in a convincing way that made them think he rose from the dead. Bart Ehrman has to come up with a kind of hallucination that is, on the one hand, like looks like a hallucination or, or has some features of a hallucination that allow him to like consistently call it a hallucination. And yet it's got to be so convincing that it caused them to transform their lives and believe that Jesus wasn't a ghost and that he really rose from the dead in the eschatological resurrection sense in a physical body. Because they could have just believed it was a ghost, but no, they believe that he actually physically rose from the dead in, in, in a physical body. Um, the most natural interpretation is just the one that the apostles gave. He he rose from the dead. You don't, And, and so the takeaway there is, because you don't have the same skepticisms that Bart Ehrman does, you're not forced to go to the more desperate route of of coming up with a, a story that is a little more awkward. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. So um, an issue an issue I see in these types of talks with like, you know, people just go out and like, okay, this is why I believe in Christianity. This is the minimal facts as um, – you kind of talked about like almost like your prior beliefs and some people would say it's your presuppositions of like, you know, some people will say that, all right, there's contradictions in the gospels. And if there's contra contradictions in the gospels and that's kind of like, I guess the main evidence of believing Christianity, that's like almost an argument against Christianity. So even if your, you know, your evidence for Jesus rising from, from the dead is with the minimal facts might be good. The, in some people's eyes, like other like reasons to not believe in Christianity might even be greater. So essentially like you're like, I guess maybe the best way to put it is you're not, if you just go out and give your mental effects, you're not dealing with their main objections to begin with. Um, do you, do you sense that tension and like, how do you get around that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I actually do address the main objections. That's in fact, my first step, remember, because the main objections to the resurrection are, God doesn't exist, Jesus isn't a, real, isn't a real historical figure, or God wouldn't plausibly choose to raise Jesus from the dead, even if God and Jesus existed. So I address those objections up front. I try to make sure that they don't have those stumbling blocks, um, and I want them to accept the gospel. So I do. So if they have other objections to Christianity, I'm not talking about objections to like biblical inerrancy. I'm talking about objections to the truth of the gospel. If they have any of those, there's not a lot left to ob object to. You know, you can talk about like some, you know, oh, I've got a problem with, you know, divine punishment. That stuff you got to deal with. You know, that's the job of the apologist. That's our job, uh, you know, to give an answer. Um, uh, and and so that's stuff to explore along the way. If, if someone comes and says, well, if I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, it sounds like I got to believe what, you know, Jesus and the people he commissioned were saying about him. Uh, namely that, you know, he's God and that, um, you know, there's an afterlife and I'm going to be judged. And that's, that's really hard for me to accept. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Why would God judge me if he made me this way? Stuff like that. Yeah, that's, those are some of the, the remaining questions that you'll need to deal with, but you don't need to deal with 
you know, biblical inerrancy. You, you can be a Christian and you can be a saved Christian without believing in biblical inerrancy. Um, uh, it, that's not to say that it's not valuable to defend biblical reliability. I think it is. I just would save that for later. I want to get them to be Christians first. Awesome. All right. That's all I got for you today, Blake. This has been a lot of fun. Um, you want to share any last thoughts as well as just um, remind people where they can access your content and learn, learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, well, just I just have to say thanks for having me on and giving me a chance to sort of lay some of that out. I hope I hope someone's blessed by it and can put it to use. Um, I would I would just urge anyone um, if they're trying to talk to someone who doesn't believe to really focus in on that path of least resistance. You're going to be shocked at how much more success you can have, um, particularly with like people who carry a level of skepticism. If you'll just like try to stick to the the basics, you know, focus first on does God exist? Read a little bit about that. Um, I recommend William Lane Craig's material on God's existence. You can, he has some great videos on, on YouTube uh, that are quick presentations of arguments. And he has really entertaining debates that you can just watch a couple of those debates and you're going to be shocked at how, how quickly you'll be equipped to do to handle that discussion. You can find very quickly, like if you go to belief map, you'll find some quotes acknowledging, excuse me, from scholars acknowledging that there's no debate about Jesus's existence. So that's the second thing you want to secure from your non-believing friend. And then third, you want to talk a little bit about why God might raise Jesus from the dead. And again, if you go to beliefmap.org, the entire site is organized around leading people through those steps. So check out beliefmap.org and, and you'll get equipped with that sort of information. And you can also get everything you could ask for on the resurrection there too, but I would recommend Gary Habermas and Mike Lycona's 2004 book if you want to explore the case for the resurrection. Um, the case for the resurrection of Jesus is what it's called. So awesome! Yeah. All right, this has been so great. I really appreciate it, Blake. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. You too, man. Thank you. Of course.